Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you can see me yet. Yes, I've got a go. So I'm just sitting very, very patiently backstage and waiting for the green light. So a very warm welcome to our esteemed speakers and to you, our virtual audience. Thank you so much for being here today at this Green Embassies event. It's an event that is organised and hosted by the European External Action Service with the support of the EU delegation in London and the Danish Embassy in London. Now, my name is Katrina Sickle. I'm just having a check still on my phone that technically we're OK, we are. I'm a broadcaster and a moderator, and I have the privilege of guiding us all through the next 60 minutes. I have with me today four eloquent speakers who will share their diverse insights into well, greening embassies and so much more. First of all, very important, can I ask you throughout to keep both your cameras and your microphones, uh, microphones on silent cameras off. That's very, very important. Secondly, now it's quite unusual in this event in that I'm going to try and keep the speakers to myself. So I'm not going to open things up to the floor hugely unless you have a really burning question. Now, if you have a really burning question, you need to stick it in the Q&A channel for the attention of the co-host. Q&A channel, co-host, keep it super, super short and say to whom it is addressed. Of course, you can make your voice heard at any time on social media. The hashtag for this event is LCAW2021. Now, why LCAW? Well, the context of the event is, of course, London Climate Action Week. It kicked off on the 26th of June. Um, it's the largest independent climate change event in Europe. It was started in 2019. And of course, beyond that is the upcoming COP26. That's a very important context. It's a framework for this event, that event that's taking place in Glasgow later this year. So this provides, both of these events provide an opportunity for everybody. We're talking cities, regions, individuals to reflect upon what they're doing in terms of climate action and their environmental footprint. And of course, as I think you should expect, diplomatic missions to the UK are no exception. So today we're joined by the Ambassador of the European Union to the UK, the Ambassador of the Kingdom of Denmark in the UK. They'll discuss their particular role in pursuing the climate agenda. We also have the privilege of hearing really important perspectives from a representative from the European External Action Service on building an environmental management system for the delegations of the European Union across the world and from the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs on its MFA sustainability initiative. So really, really packed hour. That way you get a kind of a general framing and some very specific insights into the work of the various embassies and delegations in their own transition to 2050. So that's it. That's the preamble. Let's get stuck in. If I can please invite to join me on screen His Excellency, Mr. João Valle de Almeida. He is Head of Delegation of the European Union to the United Kingdom. And hello there. And also His Excellency, Mr. Lars Tuisson. He is Ambassador of the Kingdom of Denmark in the United Kingdom. So I've got two ambassadors with me to kick off this event. That's splendid. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so, so much. Um, we're going to do one of those. I, I'm going to say fireside chat, although although Ambassador Tuisson, with that background, you don't look like you're by a fireside, but this will be a fireside chat. Uh, we might have a question from the audience. I don't know. If not, I've got plenty of my own. Now, I'd like to turn first, please, to Ambassador uh, Valle de Almeida. And, you know, an obvious first question is how has it been really, you know, to work with the UK government on a climate change? Because that bilateral relationship you know, EU UK has obviously been defined recently within the context of issues related to Brexit. So what can you tell us? Well, first of all, good morning to all of you. Great to, to have you, Katrina, moderating us. Great to have my good friend and colleague, Laos, but also a colleague from uh, from Brussels, Adriana, and the, and the former colleague in New York, Peter. Welcome, welcome to, to, to this conversation as well. Listen, uh, you allow me 30 seconds just because today is a very important day for European Union citizens in the United Kingdom. 
it's the last day that they can apply to have settled status here following Brexit. So my very last appeal, only a few hours remaining, if you are a EU citizen, if you know a EU citizen that has not yet applied, uh, don't forget because there's a lot of stakes. So uh, a last minute call for applying to settled states. Regarding your question, uh, yes, we have a, a, a lively relationship with the United Kingdom. I, 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 I cannot uh, ignore that. Uh, I think it's normal that uh, after after the divorce, after uh, a separation that we had following Brexit, things uh, still take, take some time to stabilize. And uh, but I don't think we should lose sight of the big picture. And the big picture is, among many other aspects, our global responsibilities. And if we talk about fighting climate change, this is maybe the most important global responsibility. I, I'm glad to acknowledge that we have a very good cooperation with the British government on, on, on climate change overall, on environmental issues, and particularly focused on Glasgow. So my assessment today, uh, to be short, as you asked us to be short, is to say cooperation is good. We converge on our goals. We are fighting for the same cause. And, uh, and I'm very glad that we have hand in hand with our member states, here represented by uh, Denmark, together with UK and many other partners around the world, uh, we have we want to make it a, a success out of Glasgow when we are joining hands with our British uh, friends uh, to achieve exactly that. Thank you. And I think it's I think it's very heartening to hear because, as I think you would agree, it is so high up on the public agenda, the political agenda at large globally that, you know, those kinds of relationships, no matter what the context is, it's got to be, as you said, this is the order of the day. You said global responsibilities in the bigger picture. We are aligned there. So thank you for that. Now, you mentioned there Denmark. So I'm going to turn to Ambassador Tuerson and and hear that perspective, because Denmark is very active on the climate agenda, um, a small country with a big voice. So how do you see that? Explain, please. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you so much for, for the invitation. It's, it's always a, a, a great pleasure to talk about our green ambitions because they are uh, great uh, and also very, very uh, concrete. It, it, it is a a priority for my small country, as you said, and uh, we try to have a big voice on, on this issue. And I think basically the reason is that uh, it's, it's gradually become a part of our uh, DNA in, in Denmark. It's something which has happened over the years. It's not something which just happened a couple of years ago. I think if you go back to the oil crisis in the early 70s, we realized, at least our politicians realized, that this was a, a dangerous situation, that we were simply too dependent on the fossil fuels. And that's when it all uh, began, I mean, 50 years ago. Uh, and um, at the same time, also environmental issues became more and more important in the Danish uh, society. So when it became clear that, uh, that the global warming is man-made, then of course we try to combine our know-how, our technology when it comes to uh, renewable energy and with our uh, environmental regulation in order to combat uh, climate change. It's uh, so to speak uh, goes hand to uh, hand in hand. And also I think another important point is that in fact uh, my small country, as you said, has proved that it is possible for uh, uh, the, the, to. Uh, reduce emissions and at the same time achieve a sustainable a sustainable uh, economic growth. If we, for example, look at the period from uh, uh, 1990 to 2017, we managed to reduce our emissions uh, with about uh, uh, 40 percent, and at the same time, we uh, received an economic growth of 40 percent. And I think that's a great proof that. Uh, this is not a threat to economic growth uh, uh, on the country that goes hand in, in, in hand. Uh, in Denmark, we also realize that uh, this is not uh, something that, that the governments can handle uh, uh, alone. Mm -hmm. We are very, very blessed with a very active civil society and not the least a very active and uh, engaged uh, private sector. So we have a close partnership, in fact, 13 uh, partnerships with the private sector where we work together and make sure that uh, our global climate uh, ambitions go hand in hand with our economic uh, ambitions. Okay. And uh, as you all know, there's uh, still a long way to go also for, for us, but let me just mention uh, a couple of uh, points, a couple of our 
goals and uh, achievements in, in Denmark. And if we look at last year, no less than 64% of our electricity production came from wind and solar. And that's going to rise to about 100% in 2030. I would like to mention that we, uh, as the first country, has set off a cutoff date for oil and gas production in the North Sea by 2050. Uh, as far away in the future, but still it's an ambitious uh, goal. We are still very dependent, the, the group as such, dependent on, on oil and, and glass. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, also uh, a final initiative, uh, our parliament has decided to establish energy islands in the, in the North Sea. Hopefully, we're connected to the, uh, the uh, UK. And that's another ambitious uh, project. We expect to be able to have a capacity of up to uh, five gigawatt. So, okay. uh, a lot Thank of uh, uh, concrete uh, examples, uh, a lot of achievements. But of course, we are only responsible for approximately 0.1% of the global mm -hmm. emissions. So, I mean, uh, we can't do it alone. It goes without saying. But what we're trying to do is to uh, walk the talk and lead by example. Yes. And then, of course, work uh, closely with the European Union, with our closest uh, partners, try to get as high ambitious ambitions as possible in the EU. And the EU is uh, definitely a global uh, player on uh, this agenda. So we're also doing our best to, to support the, the EU. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. And can I just kindly remind our lovely audience, please don't switch your cameras on or your mics on. I'm just going to entertain you with these good people. So please, um, if you have a burning question, as I said, it can go in the Q&A um, uh, and it needs to go to co-host. But otherwise, I'm just going to enjoy chatting and I hope we cover a lot of ground for you. So. Here we we talked about the global framework. You talked, you know, you said, you know, there's a global responsibility. If I can come back to you, um, Ambassador uh, Valle de Almeida, you said global responsibility. We hear some very powerful concrete examples from from Denmark, and that's so important that member states are able to be pioneers for others. You know, it's a big thing in the EU: replication, adapting you know, being inspired by other countries. So what does the EU expect from this upcoming event in Glasgow? You know, it's very important, the COP26. What's what's happening we, there? We, we, thank you, Katrina. We have high expectations for Glasgow. But before I go that, let me say that I agree entirely with what uh, Lars said, with one exception, uh, when he characterized Denmark as a small country. <laughs> it is not a small country in terms of, of climate change. It's, it's, it's a big player in terms of the example that Denmark is setting, uh, yes. as, 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 as the ambassador said. Uh, I think it's very important. We all, as European Union, we, we cannot solve climate change alone. Denmark cannot solve climate change alone. But we can provide the leadership, the moral, the economic, the financial, the political leadership. And I think we are doing that as the EU and countries like Denmark provide a great contribution. So, and, and just can I just ask, because you just referred back to um, to the ambassador's comments just before, and again, I'm Mrs. Keep My Eye on the Clock, just before you are able to come to me about, you know, the run up to COP, let me just ask right there, um, we heard that, you know, bringing down emissions does actually go hand in hand with sustainable economic growth. And I think some people are still not quite, you know, they're thinking, mm, I'm not sure. And it's clear, we had a clear example from Denmark here. Is that something that you still have to sort of push that message that people Absolutely. can understand that they go hand in hand? It's, it's still a case that we have to make forcefully and Denmark's contribution is, is exemplary for that. We can fight climate change and still create jobs and even maybe create more jobs because our countries in the, in the European Union will need to, to focus on innovation, on green technologies, on sustainability. That's where our competitiveness will come from, not from the old models. So, great example from Denmark. Regarding Glasgow, our, our first priority clearly is to close uh, the international negotiations on key elements of the Paris Agreement uh, and to ensure fundamentally that the 1.5 degrees target remains achievable. We have to reach that target as a globe, as a globe, as a planet, as an international community. This is what Glasgow is primarily about. For that to happen, uh, we would uh, uh, need to enhance the ambition of the national 
determined contribution. So what each country does to reach that global goal, we need to enhance the ambition. We need to be more ambitious. A number of countries need to board ambitions. Uh, 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 the, the EU, in that sense, is uh, uh, setting an example. We very much welcome uh, uh, recent announcements by countries that joined us in, uh, in the net zero 2050 attempt. It's good to have more uh, countries joining us. The second element I would highlight is that uh, financing is critical. Uh, we would not reach our goals if we cannot provide the necessary financing for uh, the entire globe to uh, to progress uh, towards that target. And I'm glad to acknowledge that we are the largest contributor, the European Union is the largest contributor of public climate finance. And we have doubled our contribution from 2013 to uh, 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 to today, in rather in 2019, 23 billion euros of climate uh, climate finance. So we are we are leaders in this, and we are ready to discuss uh, progress towards meeting one of the our main targets for the international uh, community, which is the 100 billion dollars per year target. Uh, let's let's move on on that. This is another very important. Uh, uh, contribution that we think Glasgow should uh, should produce. Thank you. And would you say, I mean, would you say you're aware that, again, there's a lot of public knowledge about the financing? There are people who are saying, listen, you know, we're going back to that COP and there was that promise. And, you know, is it happening fast enough? I mean, you talked about the EU there. You gave us some figures, the largest public climate finance uh, um, uh, contributor. And, and you talked some figures. But would you say, you know, there really is even more of a, of a necessity, even more pressure in some ways from the public I think so. I think we need to we need to continue to make the case for but we also need to make the case for the role of the private sector as, as the ambassador Denmark uh, uh, rightly pointed out and th in that area there has been a huge development and, and uh, we're talking in London which is a financial center uh, and everything that has been done in the financial sector worldwide to address sustainability uh, with again uh, if I may a leadership of the European Union on that but I, I've seen and when I was in post in New York the United Nations making a lot of work on, on this, uh, and the Secretary General of the UN is very committed to that as well. I think there's a, there's a momentum being built about financing with, with a strong pillar of public finance, but also a, a very important contribution of the private sector. Okay, thank you. Sometimes your sound is cutting in and out, but we're gonna we're just gonna keep our fingers super crossed, okay? So if you see me making ridiculous faces, you might know why if you don't hear me. <laughs> it's just your sound. So let me come. I've got about 10 tops 12 minutes with you, good gentlemen. So I'm going to come again to Ambassador Tuerson. And, you know, the Danish embassy in the UK, I don't know how many of our audience know, has been designated a so-called climate front post. And, and can you just give us a little bit of an insight into what that means, please? Uh, yes, it can. It uh, basically means that uh, it's num our number one priority here at the, the embassy, uh, I mean, the fight against uh, climate change. So we make sure that uh, everybody at the embassy is involved uh, and we do it what we through what we call a, a whole of embassy approach, where we work across the departments, but also in, in each uh, department. And that goes for, for all the departments here at uh, my embassy. Trade department, uh, politics department, investment uh, department, uh, public diplomacy, but also when it comes to our cultural department and, for example, in our administrative department and not the least our, our building manager. So everybody is involved more uh, or less. Uh, we have approximately 10% of the staff members who are exclusively uh, dealing with climate issues, but every, everybody is taking part. And this is a way so it's a specific number of embassies have got this designation, as I understand it, and they, they have a designated a specific role to play in promoting the Danish Green, the climate agenda, and in general through through various tools. That's right. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's everything from high politics to very concrete action at the embassy where we walk the talk and where we lead by example. OK, and that's critical. And I, I thank you because I hear right at the outset, you said it is across the board. So it is also at a very um, personal responsibility of individuals who are working, you know, in those 
in those various buildings, in the embassies, in the delegations. Let me just come again, and I know I'm doing a very wide ranging, I'm jumping about a little bit with you, uh, both of you ambassadors, but I'd like to squeeze in quite a bit. Um, we're talking about relationships, you know, we've got this week in London now, it's 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 very critical week. So if I can ask you, Ambassador Valle de Almeida, what is your assessment of the UK's efforts in the run up to Glasgow? You talked about the EU. You said, listen, the big picture is we are on the so we are converging. So what, what do you think about the UK's efforts? Well, I think they have a, a huge responsibility, as you can understand, because Glasgow is, is so important. Uh, and also because of, uh, you know, the, the conditions in which, or the, the context in which we have to prepare Glasgow with a, with a global pandemic, uh, which is not irrelevant when you have to uh, uh, bring together so, so many people into a, a UN conference. Uh, so I, I can only praise the efforts by the government and particular uh, Alok Sharma, who's the, the, the COP president designate and who's doing a, a great job. We're working uh, very well with him and his, and his team. Uh, we know from experience uh, uh, from Copenhagen, uh, uh, the COP15, from the Paris uh, COP and, and, and the results we achieved, how important it is the diplomatic efforts um, and to create a diplomatic political momentum uh, towards and in view of a, a, a meeting like the one like the one in Glasgow. So we've been working hand in hand, and we look forward to uh, a ministerial meeting that uh, uh, has been announced for for the end of July. Uh, I think it's, it will be an important uh, stock taking moment in, in the, on the road to, to to Glasgow. So we 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 uh, we recognise the, the difficulties of, of, of preparing this. Uh, summit this meeting in the present context, but we, we trust the UK authorities to doing their best and we are here to help. Thank you. I'm going to hold hold that thought a moment. I'm going to turn back to Ambassador Tuerson and kind of put the focus in, in the same place. You've been very um, helpful sharing concrete examples, as you said, of you know how Denmark and its own ambitions and actions in terms of the transition and the 2030 and 2050 targets, but how about the work you're doing with the UK on the climate agenda? Is there just one or two concrete examples that you could that you could give? Well, uh, it's it's high politics. Uh, that's that's a big part of it, of course. Uh, and the, the run up to COP26, where we have a cooperation at uh, the highest level, uh, where we work closely with the Brits. But also we have some uh, more concrete uh, projects uh, with, uh, with the UK. For example, I have two energy experts uh, based here at the embassy, and they are working closely with the British government, but also the Scottish government when it comes to district heating, for example, yep. and energy efficiency in, in housing. And that's something we do uh, free of charge, because as I said before, climate change, the fight against climate change is a priority for us. And we do have some experiences we would like to share with the rest of, of the world. We have the experiences, we have the know-how, we even have the technology. So I have these two experts who uh, is working closely with uh, the UK basically on a, a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Can I just say, just chip in there being a bit uh, cheeky, I've done quite a few events on district heating. You mentioned it there and with the Danes. And they are very, I mean, when I talked about replicating and sharing, this is something you're very strong. And when I had speakers from Denmark at that event, my God, they were so proud of that. So I'm actually really good. almost as proud as they are with your performance in the current championships. But we'll just leave that aside. But come on, I couldn't not talk about that. So um, thank you for that. And I, interesting examples there. You also mentioned energy efficiency and housing. Just before I come back to um, Ambassador Valle de Almeida, let me just again ask you anything that you didn't get to sort of share specific steps to literally green the, the embassy. I mean, this event is called Green Embassies. Oh yeah, there's a, a huge number of projects going on in uh, at, at the embassy. There are some big projects. Uh, we are, for example, we are now in the process of uh, uh, installing solar panels uh, on the, the roof. We are also making our air condition a lot more uh, efficient. We are Changes the lamps, we change the light bulbs, etc., and and also altogether we expect our electricity savings to be around thirty five percent 
compared to the level in uh, 2018 with these uh, big investments. But we also have a lot of uh, small projects because, as you rightly said, you can do it a lot as an individual, as a company, as a public institution. And that's also what we're doing here at, at the embassy. Uh, let me just mention that, uh, of course, we have to promote uh, cycling as, uh, as a cycling nation. So we have uh, bikes available for our interns. Uh, we have bikes available for uh, our meetings uh, around in, uh, in London. Uh, we even have an embassy bicycle pump, which is available uh, 24 seven here at, at the embassy. <laughs> But that's, uh, that's just some of the uh, examples. We also have a, a normal times, and this is definitely not normal times, but in normal times, we have around 10,000 guests a year at the embassy. And so we think about also the visits as well. So there's always a vegetarian uh, option uh, when we serve food. Uh, and we also try to use sustainable uh, food ingredients, uh, etc. cetera. So it, it involves a lot of aspects of the, the daily life at the embassy. Thank you. And I think it's very useful to hear because it is from A to Z, is it not? And part of that there, when you talked about cycling and so on, I presume that is also you had mentioned that everybody is to be a part of this. So that's also a way of raising awareness among and and in effect promoting co-ownership with the staff who work there, which is critical. Is Would that be a correct sort of understanding? Yes, that's vital. And and by the way, we by the way we have also automatic lamp shifts, as you can tell. The light went off here in the office, but then I do like this, and it should go back on. <laughs> okay, thank you. You nearly you nearly took down Big there. Ben there. You nearly took down Big Ben, but thankfully <laughs> you did not. It's solid. It's staying. Right. In the last literally two minutes, I have with you two gentlemen. Thank you. Funnily enough, my last question that's going to come first to Ambassador Valle de Almeida is something that has come in also from the audience so fantastic um can you just give us a, a tiny insight into the relationship between you know the cop president designate alok sharma and of course the the sort of the architect of the european green deal franz timmermans well excellent excellent relationship and i know that uh, uh, the first uh, visit abroad of uh, franz uh, timmermans uh, since the lockdown was to come here to London and, and meet Alok Sharma. They had a very long, uh, almost four hours meeting, and they covered a lot of ground. They realized what I told you earlier, that there is a great deal of convergence, but there is a great deal of effort still uh, necessary to uh, to do. Let, let, me, let me use this opportunity to say that uh, we are not finished on this on the EU side by far. We, we, we have a climate law which established uh, uh, you know climate neutrality by 2050 but we need now to translate that into policies in concrete policies so a uh, heads up for our viewers uh, we will come up on the principle on the 14th of july with uh, a big package of, uh, of policy policy content on industrial emissions on car emissions on carbon leakage and this will be another contribution to the momentum of Glasgow, and we expect the United Kingdom to 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 you know to adopt a new a new strategy as well uh, before COP26. So our okay. countries are as the good example of Denmark, but the European Union as such and the UK uh, still have a work, homework to do in the run up to 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 Glasgow. We are doing that hand in hand with our British friends, but we are assuming our responsibilities. And as I said on the 14th of July, expect more from the European Union. Okay, thank you. And then ahead of your meeting, I think you said you do have in any way a meeting at the end of July with the UK, did you not say? So that's all coming within that time frame. In the last minute that I have, I will come um, to you, please, um, Ambassador Tuerson, and just sort of ask about, you know, the relationship between the Danish Climate Minister, Dan Jorgensen, and Franz Timmermans. Anything that you would like to add there? I just say it's, a, it's an excellent uh, relationship. We are working in the, the same direction, so uh, we appreciate it very, very much. And as I said bef uh, before, uh, there's nothing we can do as an individual nation except uh, but that uh, we can lead by example and we can walk the talk. We have to work through the EU if uh, we want to make progress on, on the global scale, and that's what we're doing. Thank you very much. And I, I've had many occasions to have Franz Timmermans on panels and to have one on one interviews. And I am always um, heartened by his indefatigability. 
in, in, you know, in the context of this European deal and his genuine ownership of it. And, and what's very interesting to me is the just transition aspect. I think that is absolutely critical because if we don't get that right, in a way, we don't get any of it right. But what's been really helpful from you two gentlemen is to hear the bigger picture, the importance of relationships, and also to hear those concrete examples and a little bit of the timeline and the framework as we go ahead to COP26. So Maya, thank you so very much. You are allowed to take a breather behind stage. If you have prior commitments, please feel free to honour them. And if not, of course, you can stay tuned with our event from backstage. But thank you to both of you thank very, you. very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And so to, uh, to our audience, um, I'm now going to turn, as I said, we have two further speakers. So again, you know now, I think you're familiar with where you can put a very short question if you have a burning question. Luckily, we'd actually preempted the one that came in. It's in the Q&A to the co-host, and I'll do my best if we do have a burning question to take it. But let's now hear from the European External Action Service, you know, who are hosting this event. Now, the EES is building an environmental management system for the delegations of the European Union across the world. And so I'd like us to uh, hear a little bit more about that from a representative of the EES. Her name is Adriana Vasquez Garrido, and she's head of division. So if I can ask her, there you are. Voila, in the setup I have, you're right over the other side of this uh, of this big gallery view, but I see you there. Thank you so much. Um, this all fits into the pieces of the puzzle, uh, green embassies, greening initiative. Um, so give us, you know, I'd like to have some top line insights into that, perhaps some examples of the focus of your actions. And I believe that you have a presentation to share, if I'm correct. So I need to give you a moment to just orchestrate that. Well, first of all, um, uh, hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much uh, for having me here. I need a presentation to show, so I'm going to try to do that. Um, so bear with me a second while I get all the screens in order here. That's all right. It's always a fiddle, isn't it? It doesn't it matter how because... many times you do these events and every I platform it, I is different. I sorted out all my windows and then <laughs> the minute you start sharing, uh, yeah, there you are, share. If I don't click share, it doesn't Perfect. work. It is there working. Okay. So I'm sharing this one. Now I need to find where you've gone. Okay, gotcha. Are you good? <laughs> Uh, bear with me just one more second. That's there all right. I think the audience are well familiar with this setup, <laughs> with sharing content. It's never necessarily seamless. So don't you worry. Um, I can I'm actually sing and there. tell jokes, but I won't because it's not the moment for that. But I can if necessary. There we go. Now, can you put there that on are. full on, uh, can you put that on full screen presentation? On the full, um, I'm about to do that, yes. And I'm sure Let's that see. will again. I will again um, do something funny to my windows. Okay. Yeah, well, don't worry if it does. There we go. Oh, no, it's uh, shifted it again. Um, are you, you worried? Do you see the right screen? I'm not sure we you do, do. We do. We see a big screen and we see that what's going to be coming up. So, I mean, if you want to give one more try, you can, but to be quite frank, we okay. can live with that. So, um, we can live you. with that. No worries. Okay. Okay, well, I think I think you're back. You're back on the on the on the um, screen. No, hold on, this won't work for me. Um, I'm gonna ha okay. So you you're back on the PowerPoint application, aren't you? I'm afraid that's the best I'm going to be able to. No, do. that's perfect. Sorry about I, that. You you might not have caught me. I said that's perfect. No no stress. We can see it. Very so. good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for for your and um, understanding. Um, and sorry for um, holding this back a couple of minutes. Well, um, yes, indeed. I mean, the us Ambassador Valeria Almeida just, um, we are still a bit of an infant uh, institution, a survey, an infant service, um, and it's taken us a bit uh, to, um, to 20. Uh, we, uh, the EAS, adopted a roadmap to the introduction of an environmental management system uh, in um, for its uh, buildings and for its activities. The goal is to comply with something we call EMAS, E-M-A-S, um, here, um, 
exactly. So um, MS um, uh, is a certification. Um, um, in, it's a, it's a new, MS is an environmental management system um, um, organized, uh, introduced by the um, European uh, or set up, developed by the European Commission. Um, and it allows us to um, um, uh, improve the environmental performance of um, all of our activities and our buildings. So um, it's a full certification system and we aim to reach that certification for headquarters. Now in delegations, uh, however, the aim is to um, set up a um, light coordination and management system. Um, this is because we have to take into account that um, in all the different parts of the world where the um, e European Union has delegations, as we call our embassies, uh, we may not be able to be as ambitious as um, in Europe. But however, we still aim to make sure that our delegations lead by example and try to make the most given the local environment. So that's the uh, target. The first step is therefore to um, start um, to launch a survey to find out what it is that our delegations have been doing um, in the meantime, because um, even if the activity of the, this, this um, exercise was not fully organized, many uh, the um, nature of this uh, um, horror of void, so that void has been um, filled by individual initiatives from different uh, delegations. So um, we're uh, doing a survey to find out what it is they've been doing, and we're also going to introduce a system of bookkeeping to find out um, key consumption of energy, water, paper, um, to find out, to get a snapshot of what the actual situation is today um, and, and see how we can improve it. And then this graph refers, therefore, to um, the initiatives, uh, sorry, to the um, inventory of initiatives that we're doing. Now, in the slides that come from now on, um, I want to show you some examples. I think my, my team has organized many examples. I'll, I'll just show them very quickly of um, um, activities undertaken or initiatives undertaken by um, several delegations. For instance, Mali uh, has um, hired a local contractor to take care of all its recycling. Um, and uh, uh, so it sorts out the waste, paper, plastic, metal, and in make sure that it gets um, recycled. They even do uh, monthly and yearly reports. So that is, um, we've found out actually that almost 62% of our delegations already, well, actually 62% of the delegations who replied to a survey do uh, um, sort their waste. So that's already um, uh, good news. Um, in addition, uh, in Tunis, in Tunisia, we found out that the delegation had established a mobility plan uh, encouraging its staff, its staff to do car sharing and to use the bicycle for daily commuting. Now, um, of course, uh, it seems that fortunately, it seems that um, infrastructures permit that sort of uh, means of transport in Tunis. It's not the case uh, in in all part in all uh, um, parts of the world, but at least where it's possible, uh, we are very happy to see our delegations encouraging that. Um, I couldn't come uh, to talk to you today um, in this uh, UK forum without actually saying a word about our delegation in uh, the UK in London, so the your delegation to the UK in London. Um, the um, a UK delegation has uh, actually the building with uh, it's, it's, uh, the, the, a sustainable approach through the conception and execution of the fitting out works that have been uh, done in this build. So we've looked at things like energy efficient heating, air conditioning and lightning. Uh, we have uh, um, included green features uh, to make it a green building. So the roofs, the solar, um, hot water panels. Uh, there's a vegetable garden on the sixth floor um, where there's a rooftop. Um, the um, um, even the furniture, the office furniture, has been 
purchased, ensuring was being procured, ensuring a, a sustainable travel uh, to cradle products only. Um, we have encouraged a sustainable staff uh, transport scheme for staff. And the result is the uh, BRIAM certification of the building, which is uh, very good um, according to the scale of the uh, BRIAM um, um, certification. So we're very proud of that. Now, that's not the end of the story. We always aim for more, and there's always things one can improve. And we're working there on things like um, uh, improving the air conditioning system. Um, so to by linking it uh, to the actual occupation rate of the building we are uh, also um in front of thinking about how to improve the lighting system to include a uh, switching control that is um uh, more flexible um and we have are also um trying to encourage the delegation to um, replace uh, us as they have to replace um, service vehicles to use uh, to choose eco-friendly um, cars. So those are the lines of action that we're pursuing in London. Um, we also uh, um, paying attention to uh, the uh, another very big delegation, the one um, to the United States of America where a comprehensive action plan for greening the delegation was established based on an audit done by an external consultant. Um, so uh, um, initiatives were launched, such as um, uh, improving the use of energy to make sure 100% um, of it, it's an ambitious uh, objective, 100% of it is offset by wind turbines, um, we, uh, the building, thanks to that, got a lead uh, gold accreditation, which is uh, also something we're very proud of. Um, we've improved uh, transport, uh, waste cycling, um, and uh, we are, I see you coming back on screen, means that probably you stopped my time, have I? No, I'm all right. No, okay, I'm just, just giving you, I just, uh, just, just one tops two minutes, yeah, just so that... We're that, in time for our event. I just wanted to show you, absolutely, these, these are really the two examples that we're most proud of. Uh, but uh, we are thinking of, um, we're thinking, building on this, um, uh, on all the information gathered and all these success stories, we're uh, thinking about how to roll out all these initiatives to the entire network. And there, um, basically, we're thinking about um, initiatives. Um, um, uh, we're thinking maybe about in, uh, introducing a competition among delegations, uh, something to encourage um, uh, sharing best practices and to um, um, encourage others to take um, similar initiatives. We work I mean, this is in our system. Uh, we work in a very decentralized approach. So basically, delegations are responsible for their own initiatives. We can encourage them, but it, they they remain. They have the ownership for what they do. So this is why we think a lot in terms of encouraging and and sharing uh, best examples. And then one final word. One final word on um, three um, horizontal actions. First is encouraging staff. It's not can't just be what the administration does or how what we do to the buildings. Um, staff has to. We we look. We're constantly on the lookout for um, initiatives that we encourage a change in behaviours on the part of staff. So velo walk. Um, is one of them. Uh, Velo Walk, um, it started off as Velo May, it's become Velo Walk. It's an initiative, it's just a competition. Uh, it lasts about one month a year. We usually choose the month of May because that's where the nice weather arrives and everybody wants to do activities outside. There's a competition to see who accumulates more kilometers, either cycling okay. or walking. Thank you. And delegations have been very active on that. Okay. Last one is this one, very important, green procurement. If the administration doesn't introduce green criteria and fit into its procurement, there's little we can achieve. So I'll leave it at that. I've used all my time. Thank you very much. For your no, thank you so much. And again, um, it it's so important to, to have examples. So I really appreciate that because big visions are all very well without the examples. And there is a plethora there. It, it becomes 
in a way not meaningless but almost so i do want to mention that the eu delegation in london is um very happy to share more information about green delegations practical projects with other diplomatic missions in london so in the spirit of this shared approach global uh, responsibility i just wanted to put that out there before because we do have a last speaker and i want to give him time to present one important question for you that might come up in the minds of our audience if i may adriana is is eeas the owner of the buildings or are you renting the buildings because you did obviously talk it's it's complex to, to to kind of this is emas is a very interesting instrument that has evolved over the years but it's complicated in all of those contexts so are you the owner of buildings? Do you rent? Does it change? Um, sort of from a green perspective, again, for a beautifully brief response. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very important question because it does sometimes limit our um, um, our ability to do more. Um, the European Union um, owns only about 20% of the buildings where its delegations are located. I say only because this is a very low percentage compared to what um, many of the member states of the union have. But of course, they have external services that are uh, very, very old, go back many years in, in, in yeah. having um, had a, a, a diplomatic service, having developed a diplomatic service. So, so they have a higher uh, percentage of property. Um, in our case it's it's 20 percent but it's on the upward trend and we have an active policy of promoting ownership which gives us more control over what we can do to green our okay. buildings okay thank you thank you so very much i am going to um allow you to to take a breather it's and, and again i know we're only scratching the surface it's a snapshot but it's a very important snapshot thank you for being so detailed um, I'm going to let you please follow from 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 behind the screen, um, because after we've heard from our last speaker, I will close the event just in honour of the timing. But I thank you very much. So please feel free if your agenda allows to just, you know, follow us for the next 10 minutes until I close. But it's been an absolute privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker, and this is a very important piece of the puzzle, ladies and gentlemen, um, is the director of the executive office of the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. His name is Peter Lehmann Nielsen. And I'd like to ask him, well, first thank him for his patience, but ask him to join me on screen, if I may. So um, that would be fabulous. I see you. I thought you might have popped up somewhere. I couldn't see you, but, but reassuringly, I see you there. We have uh, speakers with some very illustrious backdrops today. We had Big Ben and now we've got the world. So uh, I feel that's very appropriate for the final speaker. Um, as I said, another piece of the puzzle, fitting fitting this all together. I think you can give us some, some useful insights into the um, MFA sustainability initiative, can you not? And the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Sustainability Initiative, because this is kind of the framework through which the entire foreign service is being greened. So, can you fill us in on that, please? Yes, thank you so much, Katrina, and, and thank you to all colleagues for organizing this uh, event. It's a pleasure to be able to take part from Copenhagen and share just a few thoughts and inf a little information on, on what we're doing in the Danish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs when it comes to sustainability. Uh, as uh, Ambassador Tuzen already uh, spelled out, uh, the Danish government uh, and Denmark in general has had a high level of ambition when it came when it came to climate change and, and sustainable development for many, many years. And uh, from the Danish uh, foreign ministry, uh, whose job it is to promote Denmark's foreign policy, development policy and so on, which is all very green, we also we came to the realization at one point that perhaps we should also as an organization, as a foreign service, uh, walk the talk in the sense that we should also green ourselves. Uh, the ambassador has already mentioned a few things when it came to the embassy in London, uh, but we simply put decided to launch in a sustainability initiative in 2019 and we, we decided to aim high from the beginning. Uh, deciding to uh, set the goal of being among the five most uh, sustainable uh, foreign services within five years. And uh, I think we were one of the first foreign services to set a goal like that and launch an initiative of that nature. So in a sense, it's easy to set that goal if, if, if no one else has done the same. But nevertheless, the idea was to sort of, as an organization, uh, lead by example, as was mentioned earlier, um, and also to deliver our share of what the Danish government wants to do, which is extremely ambitious 
70% in 2030 and net zero in 2050 and so on, we need to make a contribution to that. And just very briefly highlight the three main areas we work on when it comes to our sustainability. And a lot of this has a lot of parallels to what uh, Adriana was talking about for the EAS. I think some of the, it's the same considerations we've been doing, but uh, our three main objectives are as follows. We, first of all, have a strong focus on reducing our carbon footprint. So we spend a lot of work trying to figure out how do you even measure the carbon footprint of a foreign service with obviously a home service that's in a big building in a, the center of Copenhagen. That's simple enough, but when you have a global organization, as was mentioned before, with missions in, in very different countries, buildings rented, owned, very different context in general, it becomes a very complicated endeavor. But we've set out to do this. We have a full accounting now of our carbon footprint in the home service, and we're almost ready to do the same for our, our uh, foreign service. And those two elements together will be enable us to start setting a baseline against which we can uh, look at concrete reductions for the entire Danish foreign service, and uh, no less. And the key here is it's, uh, it's very complicated. It's very difficult. Uh, but once you get that kind of specific numbers on the table, you also, it, it becomes more transparent and visible what we do, but also how can we improve, uh, become better. It galvanizes action. So all these little steps that we've heard today from bicycles to light switches, you can start to add them into a bigger framework. And that's what we're trying to do. We're very much uh, engaged in everything that's already been addressed from revising our travel policy Airplanes flying is the diplomat's main uh, tool when it comes to contacts, but that's also a very, very large problem when it comes to emissions. So what can we do to improve that? Um, uh, any any thoughts on that? I mean, particularly, obviously, well, you've, you've sort of um, been preempted in a way by COVID, have you not? I mean, that has given right. you a thrust in a different direction. Yes. What, are, what are the thoughts on the travel? Because I think well, that would we, be we, we, foremost. We, we, well, we're sitting here doing this meeting, but I think we've learned in general that you can do a lot of diplomacy in, in different ways using different platforms. So that enables us to do something significant when it comes to travel, although there are limits, obviously, and face-to-face -face interaction yeah. uh, is still a key tool when it comes to diplomatic work. So we're realistic about it, but it nevertheless something we need to focus more on. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. But we're also looking at our vehicle fleet across the whole entire foreign yeah. service, turning all that into electric vehicles, bicycles, solar panels, all of it is part of our effort to sort of long term try to reduce our carbon footprint uh, measured very specifically and transparently. But then two more elements I just want to highlight. Uh, the second one is we've also tried to do it from sort of a more bottom up approach and say all these aspects of the everyday life of a diplomat working in the headquarters or at an embassy. Can we integrate sustainability into all that? Uh, and we've heard the examples today and we're, we're trying to promote that from sort of a bottom up way where individuals can come to us with good ideas, staff members in our embassies abroad or in the ministry can come and tell us this works, this doesn't work, how about this idea? Yeah. Everything from reducing the amount of paper we use, uh, the menu in our cafeteria, very controversial in a country that likes its meat uh, to start yeah. introducing vegetarian menus, but nevertheless, uh, mm -hmm. we're moving in all those directions uh, in close engagement with our staff to ensure exactly as Adriana also pointed out that we have some ownership and buy-in from our colleagues who are the agents of change. And then the last element, which maybe will surprise you a little bit, which is nevertheless very important for us, we see sustainability. You have the title greening an embassy for today, but for us, sustainability is much more. And for us, it's also about staff well-being, um, diversity, inclusion, uh, gender equality, all those elements that also go into sustainability. So part of our mm -hmm. strategy also encompasses mm -hmm. this sort of staff well-being aspect, uh, which we're working very hard on to ensure that we have policies and 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 uh, efforts that uh, that provide a good framework for our staff. And we've set the goal for ourselves that we want to become the most attractive uh, public foreign public employer in Denmark, which we're competing with other ministries, other government agencies to be the most um, the, the most popular, the most attractive place to work. And uh, that's an ambitious goal, but nevertheless, something we're, we're trying to pursue as part of this. And then finally, just two last points. 
One is mm -hmm. this frontline mission element that uh, yeah. you've actually I was thank you, thank about. you. I was going yeah. to ask you about that, yeah. so go ahead. <laughs> but just to say, the idea is also to sort of empower all those colleagues. I mean, a foreign service is a fascinating org type of organization. You have all these people posted all over the world. They get their yeah. own inspiration from the local context they're in and get great ideas for how to actually promote that. So we've designated now 20 em embassies to, to be frontline missions. We're, and given them the uh, empower them to put this front and center, as Lars uh, talked about earlier, uh, yeah. the green agenda, um, both in the public diplomacy and 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 sort of uh, uh, branding of Denmark, if you will, we have lots to talk about, but also in influencing the countries we're in, we're giving them a special mandate to work extra hard to push the UK government or the South African government. Uh, the US government and so on as part of the mandate of that specific diplomatic mission. So it's also about creating change where they are politically, climate yeah. diplomacy wise, if you will. And yeah. so one last uh, remark, and that is uh, we've started this as a foreign service, uh, but we know we can't do this alone. We need to find ideas and find solutions in collaboration with others. So we've created a network of foreign services that now uh, are sharing uh, sort of um, lessons learned and good ideas on how to promote the, the sustainability as a guiding principle for diplomacy, foreign services in the future. Mm -hmm. We started up with the Irish Foreign Service, uh, and now we have a, a good group of countries, both EU and non-EU, Canada, Finland, France, Italy, the Netherlands, and the UK, uh, are part of our network, which is expanding uh, continuously. And we're trying to link up with other initiatives that are out there. We know the US government is now also looking more and more into this uh, greening their government and trying to bridge these uh, two different types of networks, but but to to work together to find these good ideas and solutions. So, as uh, the ambassador said, and you've said, Katrina, you can't do this alone. Neither as a country trying to change the global uh, climate change situation, nor as the foreign service trying to become truly sustainable. We need to do it in collaboration with others. Absolutely. Thank no, thank you. And do you know what I particularly pick up on is that I mean. There's a lot there. Um, and then I have two questions, one for a quick answer, one you might need a minute. I do say, ladies and gentlemen, we started one or two minutes late. So I just want to give uh, this gentleman time without having to feel <laughs> to, to, to <laughs> say something important on two things that are a bit outstanding for me. But what I do pick up on is you said this platform, which is fabulous, this network of sustainable foreign services. You said ideas and solutions and i like the distinction you made there because ideas can lead to solutions can they not and i that that sort of spirit of co-ownership and and seeing how things can evolve the first question which might be just a yes or no is that network open to all you've cited countries there and where you've begun you talked about ireland and then something that adriana also spoke about you touched upon it listen you know there's the organizational structure with missions around the world is fragmented. Everyone has their specific context, uh, specific financing for it. You know, where, where does it fit? Um, so in terms of foreign services greening their activities, just tell me one or two things and how you approach that, because that, I think, completes the picture for people saying, well, that's all very well, but there are differences around the world. So number one, is the network available to all? And just a couple of closing points on how you approach that in terms of complexity that you called it. Yeah. Thank you. The, uh, the the first answer is very simple. Absolutely yes. We've started with some colleagues, networks that were existed prior to our sustainability initiative, dealing with administration, organizational issues with foreign services. So we've started with who was closest to us, sort of geographically, and and so. Right. But we're definitely opening up, uh, and and all are welcome in this network. And uh, and uh, please get in touch with the organizers of the event here if there's an interest. Uh, and, and we'll, we will we'll get back. So definitely, yes. And secondly, on the global, I think this is an extremely important point in the fragmented nature of foreign services. Uh, and, and, and I think it goes back to something Adriana also talked about, the, the, the different context. It's actually uh, sometimes more relevant for uh, different countries, embassies in, let's say, Dar es Salaam to talk to each other, to find local solutions yeah. Uh, in that context, rather than this for headquarters of Ireland, uh, uh, of Dublin, Copenhagen and London speaking together about what works at the headquarters level. So we want to promote this also out uh, on the ground, if you will, uh, because yeah. that's where these uh, solutions in these different contexts, they come mm -hmm. up uh, and then fun. you can bring those to the headquarters level. 
And then I think yeah. there's one other aspect that we're also starting to discuss more and more is is sort of a government wide approach where, yes, it's great. The foreign services are doing it. We should lead globally, internationally, but we also need to get the rest of our government apparatus on board in this. And we're also collaborating with our domestic partners uh, in, in, in Copenhagen, the, the Danish government. But I think the same type of government greening, government wide greening efforts needs to be become part of yeah. the equation uh, over time, because one thing is what we do internationally, yeah. uh, but uh, you need to have the domestic aspects there as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you for your patience being the last uh, speaker today, uh, Peter Lehman Nielsen, but, but really important to hear from you and to have um, those in additional insights. Uh, so I can allow you now, if you, if you feel you've dispensed everything you need to, um, I can allow you to take a brief, uh, to take a a, a breather backstage and I am going to literally in about 30 seconds wind up this event in case there are some hungry people out there who need to eat. So uh, it's been an absolute Thank pleasure. Thank you for all of those examples. And so uh, I turn to our lovely audience and I say, um, before we close this Green Embassies event, I'd like to thank, well, the gentleman who's just turning off his camera as we speak, uh, Peter Lehman Nielsen, and all my other three wonderful speakers for joining us today and sharing some really interesting insights into how the EU and Denmark and member states in general are pursuing the climate agenda. I would also, and this is very necessary with digital events, like to thank the splendid organising team from Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, GIZ, for all of their work on the technical side of things and helping bring the content together. And of course, to the EU, the EEAS, um, for really hosting and organising this event with the support of those uh, embassy and delegations there who we heard from today. I do hope, I kind of feel sure, that you will go away better informed than you were an hour ago. Interestingly, perhaps shamefully for me, who moderates a lot around the green transition, I have never thought of this specific topic about greening embassies and how vital and important it is in terms of their work, their position, what they do in Europe, what they do in the world. So this has been a really, really interesting insight for me. So I certainly go away better informed. Share any wise words, any words of inspiration to the wider community. Don't forget we are in the context of that London Climate Action Week. So it's hashtag LCAW2021. And on that bossy note, it's been an absolute pleasure to be with you. So I am going to wish you all a delightful lunch and, of course, a delightful summer break whenever and however you take that. But that is definitely a goodbye from me in Brussels, your moderator, Katrina Sickle. Thank you so very much. <laughs>